Okay, welcome to the How to Health pod podcast with I'm Dr. Lori Marvis, and today I am excited to welcome Dr. Doug Lyle. How are you doing today, Dr. Lyle? Good, good to be here, Lori. Well, thank you for taking your time out of your day to come and spend with us. Let me just give you a little bit of background about Dr. Lyle. Um, it, it goes on, he's pretty done quite some really cool stuff. So Dr. Lyle, a PhD, is founder of the new method of approaching human psychology and well-being. He describes this approach as esteem dynamics, which we're gonna talk about. Um, it's core insights adapted from a revolutionary biological approach to psychology. And with that, um, esteem dynamics is the, is the first of, I guess it says here that you had several different people actually affect you. This is Richard Dawkins, John Tooby, Lita Cosmetes, I guess. Yes. Cosmetes, okay. David Buss, Steven Pinker, and Jeffrey Miller. All of these individuals are considered academic A-list thinkers in evolutionary theory and human psychology. Somewhat surprisingly, insights from these trailblazers has yet to reach mainstream clinical psychology, which will be really interesting because I've, I've worked with clinical psychologists and there's some really interesting stuff that they do. Um, and thus, major advances stemming from some of the world's greatest thinkers um, have yet to be systematic, oh my goodness, systematically applied to the problems of helping people improve their lives. So I guess your esteem dynamics is a first of such efforts and you've had 25 years of clinical experience and then that you're going to teach us about that today uh, via evolutionary psychology. So your background includes uh, your undergraduate education from University of California, San Diego, summa cum laude, awesome. Uh, completed your PhD in clinical psychology at the University of Virginia, so by Coastal, <laughs> where he was awarded the President's um, Fellowship and was a DuPont Scholar, wow. He was an appointed lecturer in psychology at Stanford University, worked on the research staff at the Department of the VA at the National Center of um, Post-Traumatic Stress Disorder in Palo Alto, California. I'm also a vet, so thank you for helping us. And uh, his research and clinical interests have brought him to include health and wellness, self-esteem, uh, relationship satisfaction, the treatment of anxiety disorders and depression, and optimizing achievement and motivation. Mm -hmm. uh, in addition to his work with Esteem Dynamics, he's currently Director of Research for the True North Health Center, which is amazing, and also serves as a psychologist for McDougal Wellness Program, both located in Santa Rosa, California. And of course, he wrote The Pleasure Chat with Dr. Alan Goldhammer. So with all of that, that was, that was amazing. So where do we even start? So I would love to just kind of get a, maybe a little bit of a background on what your story is with the plant-based diet, how you kind of evolved that into what you're doing now with the clinical psychology. Yeah, that just started because of Alan Goldhammer. And so uh, he, he was extremely interested in, in we went on a back uh, backpacking trip when we were 16 and he neglected to pack enough food. <laughs> this is where this all started. And, and so I was in the tent whining about it, sort of ir irritable. And it struck a chord in him that went very deep. And that was that he felt vulnerable. And I, I knew, I actually remember that. I remember us being in that tent. And he was, he said, when we get back, I'm going to really look into this food thing. This food thing's a really big deal. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm going to get a pizza. And <laughs> <laughs> That's all I was thinking about. And uh, when he did come back, uh, he got a job at a natural food store and started reading everything on the shelves. And then ultimately came across Herbert Shelton and read that. And that made a lot of sense to him. And then the, the rest is essentially what we do at True North and what we advocate is pretty close down the line of what we call natural hygiene. And so nothing, nothing that much has changed, you know, in the God knows 40 years since that backpacking trip. So you've known each other since you were kids. Yes. That's, we were eight. Oh my goodness. I did not realize that. that I've been putting up with that guy for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love that. So he, he reached out and was looking for himself to find some answers, but now you were looking for the pizza. How did that happen that you're like kind of come around into the fold? Yeah, um, he was, if anybody ever has met Alan, they know he's not soft-spoken. And so once he, uh, once he found that he was very convinced of this, he was not gonna let it go. He was gonna make sure that I understood. And I, I think what, what I didn't know at the time, uh, which I wouldn't, I wouldn't appreciate till quite a, quite a number of years later, is that uh, natural hygiene is, is really writing uh, these, the thinking is coming from 
evolutionary theory. Uh, that's why it dovetails together as well as it does and why it's been as accurate as it has been uh, for the last 150 years. And, and so once you sort of in principle understand the notion of, of letting the organism heal itself, that it's got these natural self-healing powers, which sounds fancy, but once you start to understand that, of course, that's true. Every time you, you know, have a scratch, there's a, there's a process by which this is healing and there's no medicine that you're going to take that's going to make that go faster. And so once you start to, once you grasp the notion that health is a dynamic process and the, and the, the idea is to remove as many impediments as you can from the healing process to take place, that there's constant damage and repair, that it never stops. Um, and so once you get the, I, I remember asking Alan a question once, there was a little uh, confusion. And, you know, we don't totally believe this today, but close. And that is that um, he said, I said, let me get this straight. So I was starting to get confused about what's good for you and what isn't good for you, et cetera. And what we arrived at was I said, oh, so what you're really saying is there isn't food that's, quote, good for you. What there is is that there's food that is less than optimal. And so everything that you eat that's less than optimal is taking away from your, i.e., your longevity potential is the way we conceptualized it. And so once I grasp that, and I grasp that, these are long discussions we had in our early 20s, uh, that once I got a hold of that idea, now that made sense to me. It was the equivalent of that there's, you can get a perfect paper in calculus, and if you do anything, you make any mistake, you're getting less than a perfect paper. So it's not that there's extra credit points. You either get it perfect or you don't get it perfect. And so that, that helped clarify to, to me, what largely I believe today, not, not completely, but close. And that, that's, a, uh, that's the basic premise by which once I had grasped that, uh, it made a great deal of sense to me. Uh, also, a similar parallel issue is that I was studying economics at the time. And there's a concept in economics called Pareto Optimum. And this is the notion that there is a, there's a, a set of equilibria that take place in an economy where, in principle, the land, labor, and capital are distributed among different industries to meet human needs as efficiently as they can possibly be. And you can't make it any better than that. Okay? You, uh, it's not possible to make it any better. What you can do is make it worse. And so when you, when you start to interfere with those processes, there's going to be compensatory consequences. And of course, sometimes it's necessary. You have government intervention that's necessary in an economy for various reasons. And the economists have thought deeply about that, not that the government's paying any attention. The uh, governments don't tend to listen to economists very, very carefully. But if they did, as an, as an economic student, um, I was very interested in this concept of what, what is possible for an economy and what what can improve a situation and how good it can get and then anything else is necessarily a reduction. Mm -hmm. And that same principle uh, goes for the health of an organism. The very same process, it's, it actually is the same process because economics is actually being driven by the, the psychological behavior of humans, which is in fact a biological process. So human beings are actually making biologically driven decisions. And that process is taking place throughout a context of opportunity uh, that, that exists in the world of human knowledge and the resources that are available. The very same process is taking place inside the human body. That the human body is effectively trying to take in the resources uh, that, it, that it can get from the outside. And it's attempting to distribute and deal with those and absorb those resources in a way that is the most efficient possible way to maintain the integrity of the organism. Mm -hmm. And any, any uh, disturbance in that winds up having compensatory issues that are potentially a problem, uh, not that it might not be worth doing. So 
in principle, there may be a time and a place for medicine and a time and a place for supplementation and a time and a place for surgery. But we shouldn't, we should look at those times very carefully uh, from this view and that we should be extremely judicious uh, about that and in general have a jaundiced eye towards it. And so I think that um, nothing, and I, I feel the same way about um, uh, essentially government tinkering on economy, the same way. In other words, we should be very careful, very judicious, et cetera. Not that this ever takes place in theory. And, um, and the same thing is true in, for example, in an environmental sense, monkeying with an ecosystem. So monkeying with an ecosystem is another example of how it is that if we introduce some animal or plant that isn't native to that ecological balance, we wind up almost always finding a cascade of problems that winds up you know, being very disturbing for that ecosystem, sometimes catastrophic. And, um, and we can't see it coming, that's the point. And so that's off, often what happens uh, in medicine is that they have something that looks like a very good idea, that it looks like it's achieving some goal that looks to be very worthy. And yet what's not being respected is the fact there are compensatory processes that will take place that you don't see coming. Mm -hmm. And so from this view that really started from a, a uh, sort of a ring of truth that we felt like we were hearing in, in Herbert Shelton, it was really speaking through uh, evolutionary theory. And then also in my own independent studies of economics, all of this started to weave together into a fairly, um, fairly robust belief system that remains intact to this day. So now 40 years later, uh, my thinking is much more sophisticated and more subtle uh, and more open uh, to some degree than it would have been at 19. <laughs> <laughs> when we knew everything, all right? So uh, we knew everything then, we don't know everything now, but, uh, <laughs> but we are, but we're pretty good and we're, our thinking is not that much different uh, uh, than, it, than it really was 40 years ago. So when you describe that your, your thought process is maybe, it's close to, but not exactly your idea of the economy. Can you give me an idea of how it's a little bit different than your thought of, you know, if you do something that can detract from your health, if you're not giving it, your body the optimal nutrients, for example, right. what is, how is it a little bit different than that actual theory? What, do you, what is your actual belief on that? Um, yes, yeah, say that again. So you were saying how the, your thought of the, your health or when you're consuming something or I'm assuming nutrition wise, yeah. that you have your optimal intake of nutrients right. and that if you take something less than optimal, mm -hmm. that that can detract from your longevity. Right. But you said that your thoughts or your beliefs were pretty close to that, but not quite. So what, what is that little bit of difference that your, your thoughts or beliefs are? Yeah, I, I think um, one, one of the problems is, is that, that there's significant individual differences in people. Mm. And so, so there's a couple of principles that, that guide my thinking in general, but they're not perfect. And that is that, that in general, if people eat a whole natural foods diet, um, the nutrients that they need for optimum health would generally be overly abundant. So we wouldn't expect, um, we wouldn't expect that they would need to use any concentrated sort of nutrition. Uh, in order to improve their function. Mm -hmm. And we would expect that if we used any concentrated nutrition of any kind or any medication of any kind, that, that it would, would be likely that there would be compensatory effects. Mm -hmm. This would be the equivalent of, of the government deciding that it would be a really good idea for everybody to have solar panels on their roof because they think it's a really good idea. And they can point out all the benefits of why this is a good idea and they can make compelling arguments for what they're not understanding is that that is not an organic economic process, so it's not gonna be sustainable, so you're gonna have a lot of land, labor, and capital directed to solar that is no longer gonna be directed once your government program is over. Okay, mm -hmm. so this is, this is the problem with governments monkeying with the economy, is that they're not allowing organic, organ, uh, organic economic processes to take place, and therefore 
those processes don't actually optimally distribute land, labor, and capital to, to, uh, to a, an, ec an economic system. And therefore, there's turbulence and therefore um, closures and business failures uh, that take place as a result of sudden changes in demand that, that the market didn't see coming because it was actually being artificially stoked by government intervention. Mm -hmm. So this is very akin to uh, taking vitamins. So uh, taking vitamins uh, may have some effects at times that look good, i.e. we've got solar panels on the roof now that we didn't have before. So some parameter in the body moves into a better range for that patient and the doctor's happy and the patient's happy. But what we're not seeing is we're not seeing pressure on the liver. Okay, so we're not actually, uh, we're not measuring the fact that there's damage being done by that process while something good looks like it's happening. That is a, this is a classic argument out of natural hygiene theory. And I would say that more often than not, that's true, but it's not always the case. So uh, just as in, in the case that sometimes uh, it, we're better off if the government says we're not cutting down those trees. <laughs> right. you know, we're not doing that or we're not di diverting that river uh, just because somebody thinks it's going to be o opening up a, a good economic opportunity. Sometimes, um, sometimes it's uh, interventions are necessary and, and very useful. Um, we have to be careful and judicious about those and we have to be, we have to be smart about it and we have to learn as we make mistakes. So we have to be open to the issue that when we are doing, uh, that we are doing essentially bizarre, bizarre and unnatural interventions to a body, uh, it's very possible we may not be making a profit. Uh, I would say a great example of this, there's a thousand I could use, but one of the most shocking was the cerebrovascular surgeries that were taking place um, in you know, the 1960s and 70s. So when, when we discovered that aneurysms were dangerous and we could spot them and therefore we could hack people's foreheads off and then go in and bypass those, those issues, hopefully saving their lives from a potential deadly stroke. This went on for quite a long time and the neurosurgeons were the gods of the hospitals um, at that time. This is very complicated surgery. It's, it's technically brilliant. Uh, that you can do such a thing. However, nobody bothered to check whether or not it was any good. And it turns out that you kill twice as many people as you save. In other words, it, this, is a, uh, this is a disastrous uh, procedure. And as soon as the research evidence, somebody finally went to the trouble of actually counting dead bodies, uh, then they basically put a stop to it. So this is, this is an example of just because we can do something that looks like it's brilliant and good, and even if it is brilliant and, and spectacular in terms of its technical proficiency, doesn't mean that the patient's any better off. And so that, that, is a, that, that remains sort of an underlying theory that, that guides our, our decision-making and our, you know, our thinking at True North. And mm -hmm. uh, it, not that we aren't open to discoveries from all you know, from all over the world, from the entire database of human knowledge as far as health goes. Uh, we're always open to listen, but we're always nervous that somebody's brilliant idea about some intervention process uh, may not, in fact, ultimately be in the patient's best interest. But that's how we look at it. Wow. There are so many ways I could go with this conversation right now. Um, so for some of my audience who may not understand what the natural hygiene theory is, could you give a summary of that first? Because I have a, a comparison I'd like you to talk about. Yeah, uh, natural hygiene came out of some of these old natural paths in the 18, early 1800s and mid-1800s. And it was probably best synthesized by a chiropractor by the name of Herbert Shelton in, in the early 20th century. And Shelton was a prolific writer. He wrote quite a few books uh, and they, they all start sounding the same. And they have just basic one point that they're pounding home over and over again, which is he's, they're, they're talking about what they're going to consider a natural diet for humans is going to be a vegan diet. It's going to be unprocessed uh, whole natural foods diet. The, um, we would not agree 
that at this, at this time, that that was the diet of ancient man. Uh, we, we believe and we know that ancient man's diet included meat. Uh, but Shelton was, that incidentally, that doesn't mean it should. It just means that it did. Okay, so there, there's some weaknesses in, in, in that sort of rudimentary evolutionary theory and in naive evolutionary thinking. And Herbert Shelton and the naturopaths were certainly guilty of that. They weren't, they weren't evolutionary biologists and they weren't, they weren't thinking with the same conceptual tools that we have today. However, their thinking was pretty good. And the idea was, let's sort of mimic the, tr let's try to mimic dietarily and behaviorally the, the way that our ancient ancestors lived because it's likely that that's essentially consistent with your design. So, you know, exercise, sunshine, fresh air, uh, and whole natural plant food, and an awful lot of it raw. Okay, this is sort of what they were thinking. And ironically, if you do that, an unbelievable high percentage of people will get well from a, a whole host of different diseases. Mm -hmm. And so as, as simple as this is, it is simple yet profound. And it, it, it makes a joke of modern medicine. In other words, if you, if you gave me a, a 10,000 diverse patients, you give me 300 different diagnoses and you give me, you know, what, what, it, what that would be 30, 30 each, yeah, whatever it is, and you take the best of modern medicine and I'll take natural hygiene and we'll lock them up for six months and we'll find out what happens. There won't be any contest. Mm -hmm. yeah, uh, the, a natural hygiene approach will mop the floor with modern medicine. Mm -hmm. And so that being the case, that remains to this day, the notion of essentially take your, your you are built and your cells are being built by instructions from the genetic code. They built you. Those genes uh, uh, built structures just like they build the structure of a tree. And the tree has an architecture that is designed for the conditions that those genes have been in for the last millions of years. So, for example, uh, if you took the seed of a tree that was a tree that was living in a habitat that where the air was very still because it was protected by mountains. And you put that out in the middle, even with adequate water and not, not uh, difficult temperatures, you put it in the middle of plains where there is tremendous wind because there's no mountain ranges. That tree will not have the root structure that is likely to be able to stand up to the 50 mile an hour winds that are gonna come, okay? So its architecture is adapted to the ecological niche that those genes have been in. And so the same thing is gonna be true of all animals. So there's a reason why an aardvark looks like an aardvark. And there's a reason why a monkey looks like a monkey and a, and a, and a hippopotamus looks like a hippopotamus. They, they do things and they need things from their ecological niche in order to essentially optimize their function. And the same thing is true with people. So when people do things that are inconsistent with their natural history, there are usually compensatory problems. Uh, if they drive for a living, human beings aren't meant to be sitting all day in a living in a bouncing truck, and we're gonna expect that there's gonna be problems. People aren't designed by nature to be eating the processed foods that they eat. They're not designed to be eating the extraordinary amount of animal food that they eat. And the animals that they're eating today don't resemble the animals that they would have eaten. In, in the natural, in the, in the wild of our history. People are staying up late and they're not getting to bed on time. Then they're using stimulants to get themselves through the day uh, because they're waking up tired. They're not waking up the way normal animals wake up that are fully rested and ready to engage in the competitive processes of the next day. So once you, you know, on issue after issue, the notion is let's try to take the genes back to the environment that this thing was designed for. Probably the pathologies that we are seeing in very significant measure are gonna be directly as a result of the, dis of the uh, discrepancy between the Stone Age environment that the genes designed the system for and the modern environment that you put the person in. And so that, that discrepancy is what it is that we at True North try to narrow. 
And by narrowing that discrepancy, we see human beings improve, not all of them, but an extraordinarily high percentage of people with a diversity of, of pathologies uh, will get better. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and one further thing that, that we use is we use water-only fasting. Mm -hmm. And so water-only fasting is, uh, was noted by the natural hygienists as a major tool that nature appears to use when animals get sick. And so uh, we simply are using that electively rather than waiting for a person to get so sick that they don't want to eat. We essentially come into a situation where we know that there is disturbances in, in the person's health. And maybe a person has high blood pressure. Uh, maybe they are overweight. Maybe they've got type 2 diabetes. Maybe they've got you know, this and that, you know, autoimmune disorders. Uh, maybe they have cancer. And so... What we do is we fast them, even though they still have an appetite, and we'll fast them sometimes for considerable lengths of time. And in doing so, that, that uh, activates, will optimizes the environment for the genes to do the repair work on the body that it can't do under normal metabolic uh, load that's taking place. And so this is what we do, and I have to tell you that Every medical doctor that has ever spent a few weeks at True North walks away with their jaw open and they can't believe that this exists in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, it's that profound. The, the successes are that striking and that consistent. And, you know, that's, that's a story that, that we'll be telling till we're gone. Mm. Well, no, I've actually, I've referred many people to True North. I am amazed. I would love to come spend some time with you guys at some point. That would be Anytime. amazing. Wow. Love to have you, Doc. So you have it's such a unique way you're describing it between economy of money and yeah. your health economy. So when we look at the schools of thought for training for like medical school, what would you suggest would be a better way of education? Because right now when you go in, you're just, you're right, it's almost a reductionist theory of medicine. You're you're looking at this medicine can, can do this and you know, but we forget there's actually there's a, that's a link in the chain and you know, you're gonna affect. So how would you change how we're teaching our young people? My daughter actually starts medical school next week. So how would you have them look at the body and healing and so forth? What, what would you do? What would you recommend? I think it's kind of a mess. <laughs> and I think, I think the mess has, you know, probably multiple causes. Uh, it has its historical roots in, in you know, John D. Rockefeller's vision for uh, uh, exploiting the possibilities of making patents for medicine uh, in the early 20th century. Uh, along with it, they, they wedded themselves to the university systems of the world, particularly in the United States, and legitimate and brilliant work has been done you know, all, all the way from cell biology to to you know, emergency medicine and surgery. So the, it, it isn't like we can say that this whole thing is ridiculous. This thing is full of incredible amount of insight and knowledge that has been accrued and brilliant people that are participating in it and sometimes spectacular success. So all of that is good, but the grand overarching theory is, is, like, like a great oak tree that's missing its core. They don't really understand what they're dealing with. They're, you're dealing with an organism when it's sick. What you're seeing, uh, and this is a big point of hygiene, is the notion that health is the natural state of the organism and disease is the unnatural state of the organism that's come from something has been pushing the system out of homeostatic balance. And so there's been pressure on the, on the capacities of the organism uh, or right down low to the level of the cell. In other words, if we, we consider that an organism is just a colony of cells, basically, then we can start looking at this at the cellular level and to understand that every cell uh, is going to have essentially pressures being put on it uh, by, by its surrounding environment. And it's going to have things that it needs, and it's going to have things that it has to do, and then it has things that it has to get rid of. Mm. And if you, if you put pressure on cells, for example, in the lungs by smoking, then we're going to expect that those cells are going to compromise as best they can. They're going to 
twist themselves into a pretzel to try to figure out how to deal with this toxic process. And they're gonna do so for as long as they can, as well as they can. And the notion that we're gonna give a medicine, that we're gonna figure out some medicine to go in there and fix that process, is exactly the wrong way to look at the process. The right way to look at the process is to say, the disease that we're seeing is a result of pressure that is being put on a system that is designed to be healthy. And so what we need to do is we need to identify the environmental pressure that is out of line or inconsistent with the natural history of the organism, i.e. this tree was not built to be here in 50 mile an hour winds. That's why these, these seedlings are not making it. And in the case of the, of the lungs, they're not built to be uh, having cigarettes you know, in the mouth. And that's going to be true with most things that go wrong with the organism. Uh, a lot of medical school is taught as if there's you know, all these different diseases, and they, they will look for a lot of times the proximal cause. So they'll look at, at some process that is taking place, oh, I don't know, like maybe blood pressure. I, I don't know how they think about blood pressure. But, the, um, but they probably think about blood pressure as, well, somehow the kidneys aren't working well enough. So what we need to do is we need to amp up the kidney function. So we're going to give you some kind of a drug that's going to put pressure on the kidneys to work harder so we can excrete more sodium so that your blood pressure will come down. Well, the solution is to get rid of the sodium. That's the solution. So mm -hmm. the reason why we have the problem is because we've got a diet that has 10 or 15 times more sodium in it than the diet of the natural history of the organism. So it's no surprise that by age 50, that for those poor kidneys are exhausted. They don't have the function that they did when the person was 30. And now what's happened is that they can no longer keep up with the load. You, you just keep putting a load of, of, uh, of, of rocks on some old guy's back and he's breaking down. Okay, so the solution then isn't to give him adrenaline so that he can continue to carry the rocks. Uh, that's not going to work. That's, that's ultimately going to have a bad end. Mm -hmm. And this is the sort of way that I would say in general, the average medical practitioner is looking at the problems of health, is they're looking at proximal causes and they're looking to use medicines to try to, uh, to, try to make the system look like it's working better by putting additional pressure on the organism rather than figuring out what can we do to relieve the pressure on the organism that is in fact the ultimate cause of the disturbance that we're seeing. So... Mm -hmm. How are you going to fix this? I mean, they're pretty lost, you know, right down through the roots of it. Uh, the average medical doctor does not understand essentially what we would say is natural hygiene 101. Mm. Uh, and so as a result, they very, very quickly get specialized and then now they're down in the details and they're dealing with proximal causes. And uh, meanwhile, they're getting bailed out by the fact that no matter what they do, the system is always working to heal. Mm. And, uh, and sometimes the, uh, the docs that come, come through us will say that uh, they don't really see people heal from a lot of these chronic conditions. So they're very surprised that when you give them water and throw them in a room for 10 days and they come out and their diabetes is gone, they're like, that's just amazing. <laughs> they never see that happen. Uh, they don't ever see somebody's diabetes go away. Uh, they see it managed, you know, but they don't see it disappear. And right. yet we see that we see that routinely. We have people that come in with their ankles black, okay, and no feeling in their feet. And they might have to stay with us a couple of months. And pretty soon they're walking and their feet are feeling again and their ankles are no longer black. And we have dragged them back from being an amputee. And we didn't do it. It's nature, mm. uh, nature appropriately respected. Wow. No, you're, you're exactly right. We don't learn in medical school that the body can heal itself of these chronic diseases. We are just taught these are unfortunately we are going to suffer this world. And when I mention to some people, for example, I have a Facebook page, I have a pretty interesting interaction with people there. And, you know, one time I posted, you know, don't forget, it's not natural to take medications. You know, the body wants to be well. And it's kind of your, once you see enough of this, when you're feeding people the right food, 
because how I fell into this, you know, this just kind of popped in my lap, this whole thing, how this happened with a patient one day. Um, they get, some people get very uh, offended. And so, you know, they feel defensive, like, you know, you're saying that my doctor's lying, my doctor's not right. You know, they, they take a whole new approach to what you're saying that you didn't mean. You're just trying to remind people your body has an ability to heal itself if you're giving it the right environment. So what do you say to those people who are very negative or naysayers, or do you even waste your time with them? I mean, I'm just curious, what do you say? Because as a physician who shares this with other practitioners, I mean, I'm getting actually people now much more, I've been doing this for almost six years, and people coming in and asking, how are you doing that? What are you doing? How did their diabetes goes away in a matter of days? And sharing, but it's very frustrating when I get people, you know, they're like crazy or they consider you, um, you know, you're an alternative medicine doctor. I'm like, no, actually, I'm just bringing people back to what they should be doing. What do you guys say? I'm curious if you have any ah, thoughts. You've wondered, you've wandered into esteem dynamics. <laughs> oh, this is a great segue then. <laughs> yeah, the, um, the, the lifeblood of human psychology is esteem. And so uh, if, if you are a Wolverine, this would not be true. So uh, if you were a, a horse, this would not be true. So the, the reason why it's true for humans is because hu uh, the vast majority of human resources when it comes to survival and reproduction. And so people that listen to me, you have to, you're going to hear the words survival and reproduction over and over because those are the key components of biology. So survival and reproduction are the two goals of biology. And so you cannot, you will not find a characteristic of an organism that is not directly related to either survival or reproduction or both. There is no third goal of an organism, whether it's a tree or a bacteria or, or a human. So the features of the organism are, have all been built ruthlessly by the, the most exacting economic process you can imagine to make sure that every single component of this thing is answering the bell to do its part to, to optimize the organism's survival or reproductive capacities. That's what it's doing. And I've completely lost, oh, steam dynamics. I've completely lost the virus. <laughs> All right. So it's gonna turn out that if you're, if you're an, an anteater, what counts is that you need to figure out how to find ants. It doesn't matter what other people think of your ability to find ants because other anteaters aren't keeping track of your ability to finance and aren't deciding whether or not they want to be your friends. And if you get your foot stuck in a snake hole and some predators coming after you, your friends can't help you. So therefore you don't have friends. So you don't care what people think of your ability to finance. All you care about is whether you find ants. That's a big difference. Whereas humans, their ability to survive is enormously dependent on a web of, of regard that they have in a Stone Age village. Human beings are not meant to survive alone. They're not a solitary animal. Uh, they can, if they're crafty enough and they're tough enough, they might be able to. But that doesn't, uh, doesn't tell us anything. It just tells us what might be possible in an outlier situation. The truth is, is that genes that are interested in living alone as a hermit are not genes that are going to make it on the planet. So you can be massively less effective as a human, but if you've got 20 friends that like you, you're extremely well protected. Mm -hmm. So now you're not out there in the middle of 50 mile an hour winds, you're in a nice protected valley right where you belong. And so human beings uh, need to be essentially joined up and in a web of people that esteem them or value them. And so human beings uh, have three primary problems that they are attempting to solve socially that wind up being the most important problems that that are required for both their survival and their reproduction. Uh, the first problem is mating. So they have to find mates and they don't just meet in the woods and glance at each other and then squirt some, some pheromones in the air. No, if you watch human beings mate, a very interesting characteristic is that uh, most children are not conceived until a million words 
had been spoken between male and female. Wow. That is characteristic of our species. So some guys, you know, Errol Flynn didn't have this problem. <laughs> <laughs> but the point is, is that uh, typically that is what's happening. So there's this very strange set of exhaling that humans do that no other creatures do. It's called okay. talking. Hmm. Right? And they, okay. talk, and they talk and they talk and they're extremely interested in the neural circuits of the other human. They're mm. interested in the information that's inside that head, how they make judgments, their stories, who they know, who they get along with, what problems they've had. Unbelievable amount of background data that they're interested in. Mm. The, uh, and when people uh, love each other or find each other attractive, they are, quote, valuing each other. That's what we call esteem. And if one of them esteems the other and the other was, doesn't esteem back, then that's an uncomfortable esteem dynamic. Somebody has heartbreak, okay? The um, two, two people that could be very valuable to each other as friends, uh, that's if they like each other and they send signals to each other that they're valuable, uh, that's going to be a very positive esteem dynamic. And when they argue, it's going the other way. So arguments between people are a sign that one party believes they're not being valued enough. And so they are signaling that uh, by usually attacking the other person's credibility. So this is the nature of esteem dynamics. Esteem dynamics can flow in what I call a virtuous cycle, or they can flow the other direction in a vicious cycle. So let me give you a great example of a, of a virtue versus vicious cycle. The, I heard, I was watching, uh, some friend of mine had a, had a, doc, a documentary of Rod Stewart on the TBS, went over there to visit. It's like, oh God, I got to listen to this thing. And they were interviewing Elton John and Elton John was saying how great Rod Stewart's voice is, just this quintessential rock and roll voice, which I happen to really like Rod Stewart. So it wasn't bothering me too much. And what happened was interesting was that but then Rod is, of course, singing Elton's praises. So what's happening here is an esteem dynamic. Now, let's suppose that uh, so it's in both of their best interests to keep causing a reciprocal reinforcement cycle because they're essentially propping each other up against their competitors. You see, that's what they're doing. This is a, this is a click, and that click is an esteem dynamic that is um, helping each other relative to competition. Now, let's suppose that they had interviewed Elton and Elton had said, well, you know, Rod's one of these guys got really lucky with Maggie May, right place, right time, had the right look. You know, hey, there's a lot of guys with great voices. But, you know, Rod's got a good voice and hey, you made the most of it. <laughs> you can imagine Rod's feedback. Right. You see? Uh, or God forbid Elton had said, I think he's overrated. Like, let's suppose he had said that. Then Rod's feedback would have been, Elton doesn't know anything. He doesn't know anything about singing. He has no voice at all. In other words, we're going to chop him down. But if Elton says that Rod is the quintessential rock and roll voice, then Rod's most effective move on the chessboard for his life is to say that Elton has the best judgment in music of anybody he's ever met. <laughs> you see how that would work, okay? Right. So this is, it's going to turn out that, that uh, the reason why esteem dynamics, uh, analyzing esteem dynamics is so useful and important is it's actually this dead center on human happiness and suffering. So human beings have other survival and reproductive problems like getting enough food and, you know, staying out of the cold. Yeah, they've got some other things to do. But the truth is, is that the vast majority of human survival and reproductive success is going to be dependent upon their esteem processes. Who likes them and loves them? Who wants to have romance with them? Who wants to trade with them? This is really what these processes are. They are romance processes, friendship processes, and trading in the village. Do you have something that's valuable to trade in the village? The problem is when we start criticizing medicine, the, the, the most powerful people when it comes to this that are supposedly, they have the greatest expertise on the most important thing in life, which would be health. And when we start telling them, oh, actually, you don't. You don't know what on earth you're doing. <laughs> I can do it a lot better. 
And you know what? My grandmother can do a lot better. All she has to do is put you in her bedroom with a glass of water for a week. And that can do more for that condition than anybody in modern medicine in the world. Wow. Don't think that isn't an esteemed dynamic. That's, that's a lot worse than saying the guy's overrated. That's saying he's useless, <laughs> easily re replicated, and almost nothing they, you know, do they have some things they could do? Yeah, believe me, my, my mother can't deal with a compound fracture from a car accident. Fair enough, okay? I.e., I'll give you guys credit where credit's due, but it's not due with probably 90% of the things that people face when they come trying to the doctor for. Mm -hmm. And so as a result of that, the criticisms that we're leveling at medicine are going to get a countervailing pressure as people are going to be motivated to undercut our authority and say that we're the quacks. Mm -hmm. And so, of course they would. And yet, what are we saying? We don't, you don't hear us saying that we've got some magic elixir that we dug up off the coast of Madagascar you know, that nobody else knows about. No, we're not saying that. We're saying take these genes back to the Stone Age. Take your body back to the Stone Age. You know, exercise moderately. Get good rest, good quality sleep. Don't be using any stimulants that weren't consistent with your natural history. Eat a whole natural foods diet. That's all we're saying. And periodically, maybe fast if you're ill. So this is what we're saying. And none, none of that is radical at all. But it is revolutionarily different than the, uh, the way that the average medical doc doctor or the medical system sees the problem. And uh, as a result, we're the quacks. They're the geniuses. They're, they're <laughs> and they're going to be very threatened uh, when we trot out data. That, that shows that a simple way is usually much better. I, I don't even know where to go. I mean, that's so brilliant. I really, I'm just like, it's just like, when you said clicks, so you think of high school, and then you think of medical school, and, and all those things that happen, and residency, and the hierarchy, and the, sure. you know, just, just, you know, I called it the God complex and people walk into medical school. I mean, I went to medical school. My kids were little. They were five, three and 10 months old when I started. So I yep. was already different <laughs> as, as a mom yep. and, um, you know, as a female in addition to that. So that, that is so interesting how you, it makes, it makes you sit back when you receive that criticism or that that pushback and you just sit back and you can almost take the emotion out of it yes. and just say, okay, so, so how do now how, what type of speech or what is the words? Are there words that I can use to make that less of a blow to their esteem? I mean, I'm really, I'm really trying to reach to these guys. So that's really where I feel like my calling is, is to reaching out to other positions because yeah. I think that in our social networks, we're the ones that are going to have the authority and the ability to spread this information quickly. So yeah. <laughs> what yeah, would I, you get, what would you do? <laughs> yeah, I think that you would, uh, you make sure you, you smear a bunch of status on their heads, like you smear it on a really thick peanut butter sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I make a peanut butter sandwich and you get enough peanut butter on it. I'm like, it's a little short. I can barely taste the peanut <laughs> Next time I'm going to make it thicker. Okay, that's what you have to do. So when when we're talking to medical doctors, uh, you know, osteopaths, any anybody that that is the anointed expert, psychiatrists, we're going to say all kinds of good things and good things about the field and the people in it and all that stuff first. <laughs> like if we skip that step, we're in trouble. We we have to essentially tell them about how wonderful uh, they are, and, uh, et cetera. And then we have some additional things that are interesting. And, you know, we're not sure about everything. So we can maintain an, an attitude of some degree of uncertainty, which is true. And uh, so we, we, we're throwing humility into the pot here considerably. But we're, what we're trying to do, if we can, is to open people's minds just a little bit. We, we don't want to activate uh, what I would call an informational immune defense, that their, their nervous system will defend itself against new information that could be harmful to their survival and reproductive success. So they recognize 
that information that is coming uh, that has inferences that are going to be gained from that, which mean uh, suggesting that they are less valuable to the culture than they thought they were, don't think that they are not able to recognize that information for what it is. So we're going to have to, uh, like a clever virus, we have to put a little protein coat over the, at the top of it. <laughs> <laughs> See a little vector. Huh? That's exactly how we're gonna. That's how you're gonna have to do it. So, the okay. uh, that's that's how I talk to people when I've got any self discipline. <laughs> <laughs> you see, yeah, I have my moments as well. Um, yeah. I'm sure. So this is interesting. So when I first fell upon the plant based diet, I had a patient come in. I was in a little western site, a little town in western Colorado called Rifle, Colorado. I mean, it's ranchers, it's hunters, it's blue collar workers. <laughs> yeah. And uh, a patient came in, said, Meat and dairy upsets my stomach. I said, Well, stop eating meat and dairy. Come back in 30 days. We start adding stuff back in. Just kind of, you know, remove it, give your body a rest, and we'll see what happens. Well, she came back in 30 days, and her daughter went on the diet with her. And her mom was only 37, so young. And in that 30 days, her daughter, who was 16, removed herself of two ADD medications. Yeah. And in 30 days, when she came back to see me, she actually brought her daughter with, with her. Actually missed a day of school because she's like so astounded at what happened to her behavior, her, her thoughts, everything changed, her ability to focus. And she's like, Dr. Marvis, why did this happen? I said, I don't know, but that's so cool. And so for me, this is like, this is like, I don't know. It's like, for me, it's like one more cool thing to go look at. I mean, I'm not against it. Why are some people like at that moment in my life, I was willing and accepting of this new information. I didn't take it as a, a, a stab right. at my, esteem. why are other doctors, is it just a personality thing? Is this a, where you are in life thing? Are you, <laughs> what is that? <laughs> All of these things. You're okay. it's both, both personality. Uh, people are differ considerably considerably in how open they are to new ideas. And openness is necessarily good. In other words, the average person sits in the middle of a bell curve of openness. And uh, then there's people that are, the people that are believing, if I told them that we, we found something off the, in, the, in the crawdads, off the northeast corner of Madagascar, the crawdad eggs, we found the cure for cancer. Uh, those people that believe that, they're too open. So I'm saying they, they don't they don't have enough critical thought here. Mm. People on the other side, we could pound them over the head with evidence that, for example, how outstanding fasting is, and they could watch it with their own eyes, and they still wouldn't let it in. So these are the individual differences in people. So I have no doubt uh, that as medical doctors go, you're on the open side of that, and on the open side has cost benefit associated with it. That's why it's a it's a characteristic of animal life is to, to hatch, actually have to walk the problem of how open to make the mind. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it seems like, oh, why wouldn't you be really open? Because then you're more susceptible to accepting bad information. That's mm -hmm. precisely why. Mm -hmm. So the, um, so I forget what you're quite, oh yes. And the other issue is, so personality is absolutely in this game. The, the other part of this game that you, you talked about was what about where you are in your career? You can imagine how problematic it is for someone who's 62 that uh, a, a GI doc who's been telling somebody his whole life that diet's got nothing to do with your ulcerative colitis. And now he finds out that somebody says, well, actually, it's got a lot to do with it. And, but this is what's required. We're going to have to get rid of all the meat, fish, fowl, eggs, dairy products, and gluten. Okay, so we're, we're down to steamed vegetables, fruits, and some you know potatoes and beans. Okay, oh well, no, that's ridiculous. Well, bring it on. Send me ten of your people. Okay, send me ten of your people. We're going to see what happens. Well, I could cure them with you know methotrexate or whatever they use. Some big uh, and the attitude is okay. Well, where are they long term? Well, we know that long term, you know, it is what it is. And it's like, well, it isn't what it is. Mm -hmm. So the, the the issue is is that that person at sixty two might have to look over their shoulder down the line of fifteen hundred or twenty five hundred or thirty five hundred people that they treated and that they told this is what we can do, and watch them deteriorate. And now they're finding out 
that they told everybody wrong and that they heard this 27 years ago from somebody and they rejected it. It's like, mm, sometimes it's better to go down with the ship. Mm-hmm. And uh, so Max Planck, the great early 20th century physicist, had a phrase and he said, science advances one funeral at a time. <laughs> so as the old guard gets buried and their bad ideas get buried with them, uh, is the promise of a, of a better future and a better way of looking at things. The, the doctor of today is, is their minds are being forced open by the fact that, that we've got a wide open media. We have too many documentaries are starting to sing the same tune, uh, all off forks over knives, et cetera. And you have, this information is leaking out and more people are con- coming into contact with more people who have had things happen well for them and, and they have changed their, their way of living. Mm-hmm. So I would never argue that I expect any time in my lifetime this to be mainstream, but we're a lot closer. Mm-hmm. We're a lot closer. The, we are nowhere like where we were 30 years ago. 30 years ago, we didn't even have the word vegan in the vocabulary. And the um, vegetarian was goofball, pot smoking hippies in California that had really long hair and you know wore robes. I mean, this was this was the notion. Now that isn't the notion. Now the concept of vegan options on the on the menu are respected, and it's an important component of the economy to be thinking about. So there has been considerable um, cultural enlightenment in the last thirty years, and it will continue. And that the, the medical doctor will have this seep into their head. Uh, the a hundred years from now, this knowledge is going to be absolutely mainstream and not widely acknowledged. Uh, the fact that it won't happen in 15 years to me is a little bit irrelevant. My job is to, to just sort of tell the story kind of as well as I know how to tell it and not be so impatient with the process. And that, you know, a, a lot of, Doctors have heard me speak, and a lot of patients have heard me speak, and a lot of minds have been changed. And so I don't know how many, but a lot. And I'm not the last one, and there's going to be people that are going to have uh, uh, more articulate and funnier and slicker with better evidence and better, you know, movie star handsome. We're going to see it. You know, it's going to, this is going to continue to roll out. And the Dr. Oz at 40 years from now uh, may be talking a lot more like an Alan Goldhammer or Joel Furman or a Paul Wallace than the Dr. Oz of today, who incidentally is pushing the ball down the field a good direction, but is constrained by where the culture is. You can't get too far out of step with the main culture if you are the main culture. And so there's... There's limits to to how fast we can we can ride this boat. Yeah, I mean, I can understand even with the years that I was practicing. I, you know, I still feel guilty about the patients that I think could have known. You know, or even my own family. They were, let's see, 15, 13, 15, and eighteen. My kids and my husband when we switched our diet literally overnight. And so um, they're all plant based now. But it was a very interesting conversations that we were having and that is really fascinating huh so when you speak about uh the esteem dynamics what other parts you know i think about because i was working i've been working with dr joel Furman. we were in a clinic and then the clinic closed unfortunately when the financial backers backed out um Mm -hmm. that's why i came to florida but we were working there's a big mental health component of our program and so with the esteem dynamics, how does that work with mental illness or, you know, overeating and binge eating and the anxiety and the depression? And so where does that fit in this? You know, it's more than just sitting someone in a room and water fasting. Yes. What, what type of therapies do you recommend for someone to help them overcome such things? There's, there's a lot of pieces to this. Mm-hmm. And so we're, we're not going to be able to describe them all because it'll be, get overwhelming. Mm-hmm. It, it is a little bit like juggling. You have to you have to learn how to juggle two and then three and then four and then pretty soon, over, after a lot of practice, you know you're juggling five. 
So there's, there's a, a number of components here that are important. Uh, one of the, obviously, the first component is going to be what we call the pleasure trap. So the pleasure trap is simply that, that all, all animals are designed by nature with a major survival circuit that says, eat the richest food in the environment. And so humans are no different. So humans have a compulsion to seek out the richest food in the environment. They've got an olfactory system and a taste system and a memory system that are going to be very effective at keeping them oriented towards the richest food in the environment. So the, uh, the problem is, is that the foods today are super normal. So they're not just normal food, they're actually super normal. And by that, we mean they're more concentrated and more tasty than anything that any human being ever ate before. And as a result of that, what's gonna happen is, is that the senses will become dull. Um, in the same way that, that your ears are gonna become dull if you're listening to rock music in your earphones all day long. The, you are not going to appreciate or even maybe have the ability to detect uh, quiet you know, Beethoven on your stereo or Mozart. You just can't even hardly hear it and you can't appreciate it. The same thing is going to be true when people are eating very loud food and, uh, and they essentially lose, though temporarily, uh, their sensitivity. If you take the food away and you give them natural food, they will eventually be able to appreciate the natural food again. Uh, but a, a terrific experiment was done with rats where they gave rats essentially unlimited access to American fare for, I think it was 30 days. The extraordinary thing that happened, first of all, they, they got fat, no surprise. The, uh, the other thing that happened though was when they tried to put them back on their healthy rat chow, the average rat refused to eat for 14 days. Wow. Yes. Okay. So this is really interesting. So essentially the rat's nervous system, you know, they're, they're not like raising their little paw and giving the experimenters the bird. <laughs> That's not what's happening here. What's happening is the rat's nervous system, which has been shaped by evolution, basically says, don't be eating this lower density food because there's a good chance we're going to be getting those, that high density food. So I'm saying, so just sit right here. Don't do it. Don't waste it. There's a good chance we're going to get this high density food. And so th this is profound that, that these rats would basically go on strike and they had to be convinced through 14 days of not eating that, boy, it looks like that rich food isn't coming back. All right. We're going to grudgingly now go eat the, the, the normal rat chow. So this is, uh, think about people. So think about what they're doing to these, their nervous systems every day. They are obeying survival instinct number one, which is to eat the richest food in their environment and they're doing it repetitively. So if you were to tell them, uh-uh, don't do it, that's why you're fat, sick, and in trouble, they're not gonna stop. And it's gonna be very, very difficult for them to stop. Now, even if they do, what's gonna happen is, is that there's, there's a, what's gonna be called the decay function. Uh, that, that the amount of, um, that, that there, it's going to take quite a while before their senses get back to normal. And so uh, chemical sense, census studies will tell us that even if you're very diligent, it's on the order of four months. So uh, I've, I've noticed that, that many, many times trying to change people's diets, they can't do it for a day. They're so frustrated. Like they're just not going to do it. And two days, they feel like they're a martyr, you know, and three days, they're ready to give up because after three days, after all, they should have dropped 15 pounds by now because they've just been through hell. Right. <laughs> okay. Um, so, I mean, if people eat healthy for a week and they lose four pounds, they're all bent out of shape. And then the next one, of course, there's no way they're going to lose four pounds a week. They may have lost three pounds of water. Right. Uh, but they didn't lose four pounds of fat in a week. That's 16,000 calories. Never happened. Right. And so, but if they do slim fast and they go on a chocolate shake diet with no sodium, they can lose 10 pounds in a week. And they're like, hey, that's, that seems to be how weight loss ought to go. And that isn't how weight loss goes. Weight loss is going to typically be a couple pounds a week if you're super diligent and you're significantly overweight. And, um, and so as a result, people's expectations and understanding is way out the, out the weeds. 
they have a survival instinct that's pushing them very, very hard. And um, they also have some other things that are working against them. Uh, and that is that they're going to have a uh, undoubtedly an evolved characteristic that is going to be characteristic of omnivores, uh, which is going to be what I'm going to call a cram circuit. And so that this is going to be, uh, if you're a koala bear and all it is that you eat, you, all you eat is eucalyptus leaves all day, but there's no such thing as getting really excited about some eucalyptus leaves. It's like they are what they are. <laughs> Your the cattle are, you know, it's grass, guys. Uh, I've actually heard Howard Lyman has said that uh, cattle are very picky about the grass, and if there's richer grass out in the field, they'll eat all the rich grass first, which is oh, it. Wow. Yeah. The um, you can imagine if you doctored up the grass to make it effectively rich, they would absolutely do that. But most animals are eating essentially a mono diet or pretty close to it. They're eating a specific animal or they're eating a specific plant. And therefore, there's no such thing as high variance in the biological value of the food. Whereas human beings are, have the widest palate of any animal on earth. And that palate goes from leafy greens at 100 calories a pound uh, all the way up to nuts. Uh, which are going to be 2,500 calories a pound. So they literally run the gamut of 25 to 1 in terms of calorie density. So most typically, human beings, most of their uh, intake would have been from uh, raw fresh fruits and vegetables and uh, tubers, uh, carbohydrates, and meat. And so uh, they, they got into what looks like somewhere probably between 5 and 15% of calories may have been from honey, which is an extraordinary uh, concept that, that I was completely ignorant of until I talked to Richard Langham. Uh, and he told me that, that, that we think that that's probably true. So, so thus the human sweet tooth, because honey is as effectively sweet as any straight sugar. The, uh, but they wouldn't have got that much honey that often. And so even at 1,800 calories a pound, uh, it would have been rare. The nuts and seeds would have been relatively rare. They would have been really prized. But the main dose of calorically rich foods would have been meat. Um, and it would have been meat. It would have been happening um, irregularly. And most of the time, we know this. I'm not just speculating back 30,000 years. The truth is we've got... 175 hunter gatherer tribes have been under observation. So we know uh, how people lived uh, throughout the course of our natural history because all of these tribes have basically the same structure and it doesn't matter if they're in the highlands of New Guinea or they're in the Congo or they're in Lapland. They're all, no matter where on the globe you go, these 175 tribes, even though they're, they may be more than 100,000 years apart in terms of their genetics uh, because they're in different parts of the globe, they're all living the same way which tells you that this method of life goes back further than when humans first came out of Africa uh, 110,000 years ago. So that being the case, uh, we know that human beings ate a fair amount of meat. Uh, that meat would have been periodic, and it also would have been unpredictable, and it would have been most of the time not that much. So there might have been some game killed, and then it's divided up, uh, the meat is typically divided up in villages. It's not every man for himself. It's a communal uh, process. And then once in a while, they would make a big killing. And when they did, then people would cram. It's a, a completely adaptive, reasonable uh, inference to see that human beings, despite normal satiation mechanisms that would have been ideal for the organism to honor, which people typically will, if you were able to occasionally get your hands on rich food, i.e. 800 calorie pound meat, as opposed to a 365 calorie pound potato, then go ahead and cram it in and cram it past satiety. And so that, that would have been a fairly typical event. The um, human beings now are confronted with foods that are much richer than that. Uh, peanut butter sandwich, even among a vegan that thinks they're doing a good job. So they've got almond butter and whole wheat bread in the refrigerator. And there it is. And that is 2,500 or 2,000 calories a pound is what that is. So that is two and a half times the calorie density of the meat. 
And when you do that consistently, uh, what we're able to do is activate the cram circuit every night. So now we get an interesting problem that's going on. And so that, uh, I believe that that's a, that's a problem that people have shaking uh, because even, even after they've made what they consider to be really intelligent, highly uh, uh, difficult and challenging sacrifices. So they may have gotten rid of all the meat, fish, fowl, eggs, dairy products, and they've gotten rid of the oil. Okay? So they've gotten rid of most of the salt. They've gotten rid of most of the sugar. In other words, now we're talking about a rare, a rare committed whole, base, you know, whole plant food based human that is determined to do this. But they've got some rich food in the environment. So those foods are maybe biochemically excellent. They may have a bunch of nuts in the environment. They may have some dried fruit. They may have some, uh, they may have some processed cereal grains. So they may have some things in there that they know are biochemically fine. But the problem is, is that they are sufficiently rich that the cram circuit can be motivated uh, to take advantage of it. And now they're having a hard time. So not understanding why it is that they're having this hard time can lead them to uh, a host of motivational problems where they kick over the table, give up, they don't want to try. They are disgusted with themselves. They, uh, there is, there's a whole dynamic uh, that I describe on my website numerous times in different lectures and different, uh, I have a lot of audios that, that I essentially uh, explain how these dynamics work. But people, people are, have a unique motivational hurdle that is not going to happen in other animals at all. And that is that if you think that other think people think of you more highly than you believe is true, then you are actually motivated to not try. Okay, so this is a very, very interesting dynamic. So watch how this works. If you are the heavyweight champion of the world, and you do not believe that you can beat the challenger, then you don't want to fight him. Okay, so that, that is that dynamic. Now, if you are the challenger and you believe that you can beat the champ, you absolutely want to get in the ring with him because you, have, you believe that you are going to gain by this process and not lose. So human beings have the problem that when other people believe that they are capable of doing something, but they are not believing they're capable of doing something, then they have a countervailing motivational trap that essentially says procrastinate and do not try. Okay? This, is, this is the person that gets an award for their poetry acumen in high school and they never pick up the pen again. Okay, so this is, uh, this is a, a tremendous dilemma if you're the son or daughter of a celebrity with great beauty or talent. So these are, these are these interesting problems. And when people heap praise, uh, it doesn't even have to be heaped. It can be signaled as an expectation that if, uh, if people expect you to be able to do something because it seems reasonable and they believe that you should be capable of doing it, then if you get evidence that you might not be able to do it, then you are highly motivated to make clear to them and to everybody else that you're not trying. Now, this is a major issue with addiction, and it's a major issue with trying to keep on a healthy lifestyle because people find out they, they have a cram circuit, and they know that cram, you know, they have failed by the cram circuit. Many times they have tried to not indulge it, but they do it anyway. And so as a result, um, they have failed enough that they are suspecting that they cannot solve this problem and they're not sure why. And however, they know that their doctor, or their therapist, or their counselor, or everybody else sees them as competent and conscientious and intelligent and informed, and therefore they ought to be able to do it. And so what they can sniff is that if they try, that they're likely to fail. And if they fail and they're caught being caught trying, then they have failed, then they have lost more. So what you will see is people procrastinating at this. This is what I call the ego trap. So they have more status to lose than they have to gain. And uh, this, this trap is very subtle and it can be sprung from a, you know, a couple of different locations. Uh, it can be strung uh, from the inside, from the person's expectations from themselves. So this is very, very subtle. And uh, this is part of 
understanding of steam dynamics to understand how this takes place. Um, once you spot it clinically, it's actually easy to see. And you can see that the person is procrastinating and feeling embarrassed and not wanting to really try hard. They're not excited about it. They feel intimidated by it. They're backing away from it and they will fiddle. This is very much akin to what you see in addicts that are expected to be able to put down the bottle or put down the, the cocaine or whatever it is, or the cigarettes, and they fiddle, okay? They fiddle and procrastinate and they have a frustration and a bitterness and they also go on tilt, i.e. they show us all that they're not really trying. And, um, and they watch me while I demonstrate to you that I'm absolutely not trying as I light up a smoke. That's right, I'm not trying. Okay? It's like a teenager. Yes, but this is what's driving this is esteem defense. Okay, so this is, this is what's happening. This is the brilliant student that everybody thought was going to be so great and turns out that it's harder than they thought and now they kick over the table and they flunk out. So they're making it extremely clear that I'm definitely not trying because if I was trying, I'd be doing pretty well. So the fact that I'm flunking out, you can tell I'm not trying at all. This is actually a signal that they are sending to their social environment. So this is, um, uh, this is a major problem uh, with respect to this particular problem because once you learn what you should be doing, it seems obvious and straightforward how to do it. And it turns out, no, there's a myriad of traps and there's all kinds of challenges in here and it's complicated. And so uh, steering somebody through the, the, um, the minefield that waits for us when we try to take this on, you know, that's what I do. That's what True North's for. That's what you're, that's what Dr. Berman's trying to do. That's what all these docs are trying to do is they're, they're trying to help people get through this uh, minefield. That's what you're trying to do. And it's trickier than you think. It's, it's surprisingly, sometimes it's not. You'll have that individual that'll just say, hey, sure, it makes sense. But that's actually a rare individual that sits in a rare ecological social context with a rare personality that simply just shrugs their shoulders, grabs the healthy food, and begins. That happens. When that happens, we all look at each other like, why doesn't everybody do that? But the answer is 19 out of 20 won't. 19 out of 20 that want to do this uh, face a variety of challenges that are going to be surprisingly tricky and quite a learning curve. Uh, as they go on their own personal odyssey to try to pull this together. Well, wow, that's a lot to think about because as a, a primary care doctor, I think about the conversations that you have with a patient in a short, brief window. Right. We are not equipped at all right. to take this on or even begin to tackle that because I, I do have – fairly good success with patients, but I, I take it in a way of, I almost think of them as family. And yes. so um, that relationship that I develop with my patients, I think has made me be able to be more uh, successful Yes, because it's almost like taking their hand and mm -hmm. saying, you can do this, come back to me, we'll figure out the, the challenges together. And I think right. that may be part of it. It's just my personality. I think yeah. it's been helpful. So how... Fascinating. Wow. I've been, I touched you a long time. I didn't even realize how quickly the time no went by. I was like, oh my goodness. <laughs> I could talk to you all day. Um, this is so fascinating because the mind stuff is so important that we just totally disregard, I think, in, in primary care, especially, um, you know, when you think about, and I think about all of those Wow, interactions with patients. You know, I had a patient who was morbidly obese and he was told he needs a, you know, a triple bypass and he's sitting in my office and I'm like, you could avoid this. You could do this diet and do this and they don't have to crack your chest open. They're like, I can't give up meat. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> what is going on? You know, and I, yeah, that, it's just so fascinating to me that I'll, I'll never, I guess I'll never learn enough. I mean, until the day I die, I will. Right constantly just be in awe of yes. the human. <laughs> yeah, you got it. <laughs> I tell people, you know, human, we're messy creatures, and then, but we still, we still love them. <laughs> so, yes. wow, I, there's so much more I could go into, um, but I don't want to keep you any longer, because I know 
you've taken a big chunk of the time. No worries. <laughs> you can talk anytime you want. It's a pleasure. Uh, it's a pleasure to talk to a colleague that's really, you know, you're talking much more medical uh, than I am. So right. I'm usually not talking, trying to address their problems, but I'm trying to address um, the, you know, the behavior changes that, right. that we're talking about. And you're, you're doing the same thing, you know, as you can. And uh, it makes sense to me that, you know, you, you sit in a unique position of authority with patients and the way you come across and not, not fanatical, but warm and confident. Yeah, this, right. this feels good. And also I, I pick up from you that you would not set really high expectations and, and be pushy. And I have to say some of your male colleagues, <laughs> Your male colleagues do. <laughs> you know, it's it's funny. So it depends. Most of the time, I'm like, whatever. I meet them where they're at. The patient, you know, we make small steps, achievable, build right. their confidence, self esteem, get them yes. moving in that right direction. Right. Um, but then there's some that really want to be pushed hard and yes. say, "Well, just tell me what to do." I'm like, "Okay," right. <laughs> and we take it on. You know, so it's really those are really those are those rare individuals. You know, um, right. but. Uh, and it is interesting that what I found, though, is living in a small town when I started doing this was that, you know, before I knew it, I had, you know, my son was playing baseball. So before I knew it, I had half the baseball families eating this way, right. <laughs> you know, because they saw, you know, my kid is doing very well athletically and the recovery is great. Or let's say, you know, um, I know a lot of the moms and some of the moms are doing it. So there's a lot of really interesting things with the uh, accountability in your community this yes. start happening um, as well. That, yes. That's fascinating. This is Very really good. cool. Wow. So, I, I, yeah, I'm going to have to probably have to have a second interview with you at some point. Anytime, <laughs> Anytime Doc. It, it, it's a pleasure. Absolutely. Yes. Will you be at the Plantrition Project uh, or the International uh, Dr. Stoll's in California in September? No. I'm going to be speaking with Dr. Stoll's in Midland, Texas oh, in a couple okay. of weeks. So oh, okay. You brought me on there so you know sometimes you're one place sometimes you're another but, right uh, i was uh, gonna say uh, i was gonna be there to reach out and meet you in person but yeah absolutely but we'll, uh, we'll, we'll hook up and make make sure we keep keep an eye out for each other absolutely well thank you so much for your time and again so your website is esteemdynamics.org yes. um people can actually even book one-on-one uh, -on -one to uh, talk with you is that correct sure. Yeah, I've got oh. slots every week I set aside just to talk, talk to reg regular people about regular stuff. Wow, I can't imagine anything you talk about is regular. <laughs> I mean, I, I, and now just with the economics thing and thinking about that, that's a whole new way of looking at this. So I'm going to be mulling over that like all night. Just It'll just be spinning around in my head. And then the million words and I, there's, yeah. just so, there's so much going on here. Oh, I love it. Oh my gosh. So, okay. Well, thank you again so much for your time. And it was such a pleasure. And wow, I'm, I'm so thankful that you said okay to this interview. Absolutely. Great to meet you, Lori. Yeah. And, you know, I just like to say, in the conversation, I always like to say, um, I acknowledge you and say thank you for everything that you've done over the last 40 years that you've been open to this journey with Dr. Goldhammer. And uh, we appreciate you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.